This morning we're reading from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this ministry... This mystery was not made known to humankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, This grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let me review briefly where we are in our sermon series as we begin this new year. We're doing a nine-part series, a little longer than I prefer, but this year we have seven core values we're trying to explore. I wanted to do an introductory sermon and a closing sermon. That's also nine weeks. That's how many Sundays we have between the first Sunday in January and when we begin Lent, so this time it seemed like nine was the right number for us to think about this as we move into the new year, as ready as prepare our hearts and minds to move into Lent. To hear our Barton Clinton Gordy speaker, Bishop Snazy, who will be with us the second weekend of March. So we're exploring this epiphany or manifestation of what God is doing through Christ. But we're also doing it thinking about our own lives and our own time and how that is working in our lives. Last week we began by reading in this letter from Paul to those early Christians at Ephesus. In that section we read last week which was chapter four basically he was talking about a maturing body of christ or church and what that looks like if we wanted to identify growing or maturing christians what does that look like and in short what paul said is that it looks like people building up one another in love People like us building up one another in love in terms of how we treat each other and how we work and worship together, how we extend that love to others in mission and ministry. One of you came last week after we read about Jesus saying he was a prisoner in Christ or of Christ or captive of Christ this week. In verse 1, he says, I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus. But in my Bible, there's a little letter, a little footnote that says the for could also be translated as of. We talked last week about whether or not he's saying he's captured by God or is he giving himself to God. The preposition might make a difference, but as you read through all of Paul's writings, I get the sense, at least, that he's saying both of those things. That this is a dual dynamic of faith where God is reaching out and calling him, and at the same time, he's also surrendering himself or giving himself to God for the work God wants to do through him in the world. I think a healthy human divine relationship always recognizes that back and forth where God is offering us opportunity but also calling us, where we have opportunity to respond, to say yes, to say no, to consider it through our free will. But in a healthy faith dynamic, God calls and we respond. God loves us and we share that love with others. 
growing faith is a back and forth dynamic between God and us. It's a little bit like breathing in and breathing out. We need both. Both are necessary if we're going to stay alive, if we're going to thrive. We can't choose one or the other, but both of those are important. You can hear this as you look at these letters from Paul, these different phrases he use, uses. I think we can see it in verse 1 and 2 today. He writes, This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you've already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you. Then if you drop down to verse 7, he refers to this again. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. You can hear the sense that Paul has that God is at work in his life, and yet he's choosing to respond to that, to be a servant of that. Oh, he may have just responded once, but not Paul. He spent the rest of his life proclaiming this gospel, traveling around the Mediterranean, speaking, arguing, debating, proclaiming to any and all who might listen this mystery of Christ, as he calls it. But you can see in his life this both and dynamic. But in the passage today, he also says his particular calling or what he calls this revelation from God, Paul calls the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. He says you can read about it in the first two chapters, but then he goes ahead and gives a little summary in verse 5 and 6 today. He writes in these two verses, In former generations this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul was Jewish. He's saying, we have known God for a long time. But this same God of the Jews has now sent this new revelation through Jesus, who was a Jew, and now through me, Paul, and others who have become his followers. And just as the Jewish people understood themselves to be the community or the family of God, the beloved children of God, Paul sees this new revelation through Christ saying that it's no longer limited only to the Jews but this extends beyond the Jewish family to the Gentiles. Paul understands that God is claiming everyone through the Jewish people, yet this is a new revelation. This is a mystery to Paul. It's hard for him to understand what God is doing. Nonetheless, he believes that God is doing a new thing. It's pretty strong language he uses about those who were formerly seen as outsiders to say they have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Not second-class heirs or some other kind of heirs, but fellow heirs, sharers in the same promise of God's love and goodwill toward people. Not part of some other body, but part of the same body, all part of the same family. Paul's already said in chapter 2 how this works, this gift of God, this salvation from God. He says it's like this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not the result of work so that no one may boast. Then in today's passage, he added this. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that God has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in Him. Paul has come to believe that it is God's eternal purpose purpose to include those formerly thought 
outside of God's love. Paul goes to great extent to make sure we understand that there's not something one group can do to qualify and leave others out. It's not a, some kind of human work that makes us deserve God's love. Rather, Paul's come to believe that God's love has been extended to everyone through Christ Jesus. It's a mystery to him, but also a revelation that he wants to proclaim to all the world that God's great love is at work in everybody's life. Every one of us has access to God, Paul says, access to God through Christ based on God's great love of us or God's grace and mercy and forgiveness offered to us and then received by us who will through faith or trust in the truth of what God is doing in Christ. It was that kind of theological basis that our leadership team was using as they were thinking about articulating core values for us. They wrote, the Boston Avenue Church community affirms everyone is a beloved child of God. That group decided that should be our first core value, that we make clear that we believe God loves each and every one of us, and we want to affirm that in all that we do. John Wesley, who is the founder of the Methodist movement, and so we see as the founder of the United Methodist Church, wrote extensively, taught, and preached consistently about God's grace and God's love for us. You can read about it in so many different parts of the works of Wesley, where he makes clear that God's grace is available to all. He even talks about what he calls prevenient grace. You may have heard those words before if you've been through a Methodist confirmation class or a Methodist theology class. Prevenient grace, Wesley described as a grace that comes before, or God's love and presence that's with us before we even recognize it or acknowledge it or are aware of it, that God is already at work in our lives through prevenient grace, Wesley said. Trevor Hudson is a Methodist pastor from South Africa. Some of you who have been here a few years might remember he stood in this pulpit one October Sunday morning when he was doing a tour of North America and preached for us. He did a wonderful job. I got lots of great feedback from people who enjoyed his proclamation of the gospel that day he was with us. He's written several books. We use one of those books later in that same year in some of our spiritual growth classes. I put the title in your outline, Discovering our spiritual identity, practices for God's beloved. The whole book is full of exercises to help us grow closer to God or to grow spiritually. One of those exercises he writes about is what he calls the beloved charter. In that section of the book where he's talking about that exercise, he wrote these words. I want to read them to you. He says, the message... I most want to communicate is the marvelous news that at the heart of the universe there is a divine lover who longs for every one of us to wake up to the amazing truth of our belovedness. Then he goes on to write about his own struggle of integrating what he's read about theologically and read about in the Bible. He writes, I found it extremely difficult to accept that God delights in me. I knew about God's love in theoretical terms, but there seemed to be a yawning chasm between the knowledge in my head and the experience of my heart. Maybe some of you have had that same experience. Well, you've heard about God's love, but you wonder, does that really mean you? Or you've taken a misstep, you've stumbled and fallen, you've done something that you believe is sinful or disappoint or hurtful to someone else, and you wonder, does God still love me? Will God's grace still be great enough to include me now? And the gospel says over and over, oh, yes. God's love is greater than all sin. 
You are a beloved child of God, not because you've earned it by doing everything right, but because God is your creator, and as Paul said last week, Father of all, and in all, and through all, and with us all. And the beloved charter exercise that Hudson suggests, he talks about taking a few Bible verses looking for those that speak about how much God values us, and then taking those words or phrases or ideas out of those biblical passages, putting them in your own words in a paragraph. He says five or six sentences would do where you can read those promises, those claims in the Bible about God's love for you. As I was working with this leadership team on these, I thought of all the different places that's talked about in the Bible, certainly in this letter from Paul to the Ephesians, but I also thought of Genesis 1 where it talks about we are made in the image and likeness of God. Genesis repeats that in chapter 5 that we are children of God because we are made in the image of God. That God's imprint somehow is upon us from our very beginning. I thought about those stories in Luke 15, those where Jesus tells that series of parables about things that were lost and then found. And it talks about how much God wants lost things to be found and how much rejoicing there is in heaven and how much joy comes to the world when something that has been lost has been reclaimed or redeemed or found. The last one he tells about the lost son Make sure we understand that even when we don't feel worthy because choices we might have made or failed to make, that God is still seeking us, that God is still looking for us. And as soon as God sees that we are ready, God dashes back toward us and embraces us. It's a great affirmation that we are beloved children of God. Or I thought about the psalm so many times, praising God, but also those passages that talk about humans. And like in Psalm 8, where it talks about we're made just a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. Or the 139th Psalm that talks about how wonderfully we are made, fearfully or respectfully and wonderfully knit together by God. It's a great affirmation of how important humans are in the life of God. Well, Hudson suggests that after we have found a few of these passages and read through them, that we write them into a charter that we can use over and over until we make that connection of things we have heard and connect them to things that really we believe and live out of at the core of our being. He makes one further suggestion when he's talking about the beloved charter. He says, you might just try visualizing Jesus saying these words to you, that as you read through the charter you have written, that you imagine that Jesus is sitting there with you and speaking those words to you. It can be a powerful experience of sensing the closeness of Christ, of sensing God drawing us ever closer into a more intimate relationship. Just something you might try, Hudson says, that might help you develop your life in Christ at a deeper level. But of course, whatever the exercise is, it's all to help us make sure that we understand this applies to us, that God's love includes us, and not only us, but anybody else in the world, that we're all children of God, that in fact, God's love includes even those that we would be more comfortable to exclude or maybe have excluded in our lives. Surely it is good news to know that God loves you. You are God's beloved. We are God's beloved. Look around the sanctuary and when you see faces, when you see people you know or maybe do not know, you think they are God's beloved. Oh, look, you are God's beloved. You are God's beloved. Oh, there's another one of God's beloved. Because God's love is alive and active everywhere, the gospel says. We want to seek to be a church 
that make sure that we proclaim that good news and that we share this good news we have come to know in Christ with any and all who might be in need of hearing it. So we want to make sure when we greet someone coming into worship or coming for a funeral or a wedding or a program or a dinner or whatever they might be coming here, that they're greeted in such a way that they know that they are welcome here, that they know that we believe they're a beloved child of God. We want it to be in our published materials. We want it to be clear in our social media posts. We want it to be clear in all of our ministry settings across the age spectrum and lifespan that we are people who've experienced the love of God and we are ready to share it with any and all that might be seeking it. I want to read to you before we close one more passage of Scripture. This one comes from 1 John, over toward the end of the Christian Scriptures of the New Testament. There's several smaller books, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, our letters over there. This is from 1 John chapter 4. Hear these words that are written there. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But then the author goes on to say, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Can you believe that God's love could be made whole or full or perfect in you? One of the things that got John Wesley in a lot of trouble was talking about God's love being made perfect in human beings. People didn't like hearing that. It seemed like too high a claim. But Wesley went out of his way to make the point that it wouldn't be mentioned, it wouldn't be promised in the Scripture if it wasn't possible. And so he says, of course, it might be difficult. It might take us our whole life long to get to the place that we are fully filled with God's love. That we're made perfect in love. But Wesley said that's what God is doing. At one point he writes, I think that God may have raised up Methodists for this very reason. So that we might proclaim that God's love can be made perfect in us or whole or full or mature in us in our lifetime. Do you believe? Are you ready to affirm that everyone is a beloved child of God? The Gospels claim that life at its root, that life at its best, is grounded in this recognition that we experience the most abundance when we recognize that God loves us and we're ready to share that love with others. That in fact, we are ready to affirm that everyone we meet is a beloved child of God. I pray that in 2019, we might let this core value, as we're calling it, permeate who we are and guide and direct all that we say and all that we do. If we can take that step together, it'll be a wonderful 2019. Amen, and thanks be to God.